Welcome to the Etsy Conversations podcast, featuring inspiring interviews with Etsy shop owners, hosted by Ijama Elazu. Hi, and welcome to the Etsy Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Ijama, and I thank you for joining me for another episode of the podcast. This week, my guest is Janine, and Janine runs the Etsy shop Quotations. Janine's been on Etsy since 2011, and um, you know I like to talk um, to people who have been on Etsy for a while, especially now just because of everything that's going on on Etsy. I like to get an idea of um, um, how they feel about all the changes because there's so much going on. And so, Janine, thank you so much for being my guest and welcome to the podcast. Hi, Joma. Thank you so much for having me on. Yes, you are so welcome. 2011 seems like a long time. Does it feel like um, a long time to you to have been on Etsy? Yes. (laughs) I actually had to go back and check when I first opened my shop. Um, But yeah, it's been, you know eight years it feels um like an unbelievably long amount of time yeah great well before we get into that um can you introduce yourself tell us a little bit about you and what you do on etsy sure um so as you said my shop is quotations spelled k-w-o-h like my last name um and i uh, primarily make handmade greeting cards that celebrate a diversity of identities and uh, life experiences. Um, and I, I try to focus on those often um, underrepresented. Um, and I've in recent years, you know, been expanding beyond greeting cards to art prints and other gift items like tea towels and tote bags. Um, in terms of how I make the cards, the cards are letter pressed, So I print them one at a time. Um, on an old printing press for that um, sort of embossed feel. And then I paint them in by hand. So um, they really are a labor of love. Yeah. Now, how did you, first of all, how did you acquire an old printing press? Is it one of those antique ones, like not Gutenberg style, but something along those lines? Yeah. If you imagine that it's probably closer than you, <laughs> than you think it is. Really? Um, yeah, I actually, I don't have my own. Um, that's uh, that's my dream. But I rent time um, at a letterpress studio. Um, so they have printing presses that, um, that you can rent on an hourly basis. Oh, um, nice. And so because you, you rent time to actually make the cards, do you factor in the, the cost for renting time at the studio into the cost of each card? Um, I do. I didn't at first, um, but I have tried to be better about factoring in all the costs, not just the material costs, but the time, the actual rental time, and then also my labor Yeah. Um, into the cost of the cards. Yeah. Okay. So because your process involves using equipment that you don't own, do you stock up on inventory or do you do you make it as you get orders? And if you do keep an inventory, how do you decide what prints or what cards to keep in stock and, and which ones to make just as you get orders for them? Sure. Um, so that's changed over time also. So before I was, you know, making them, as I needed them, um, mm-hmm. as the orders came in. And after I've had a couple of years, you know, I every so often look at my orders. So I'll go, for example, into Etsy and like download the order history mm-hmm. and using Excel, I'll take a look at which are the best sellers. Um, and then based on that, I've started stocking up on inventory of the cards that okay. um, are selling more. Okay. And so when when you come up with a new with a new art print or a new card do you make just the one prototype first to see if it moves and how the market receives it before you you make um a larger run of them 
Yeah, definitely. And sometimes even before I make the actual card, um, I will sort of, uh, you know, I'll post like a digital sneak peek on my Instagram oh, and mm-hmm. just see if, um, you know, what the reaction is. Um, and that's kind of like a, a um, I know something I do first to see if I even want to make a prototype. Um, and if it feels like it's a card that um, is re- resonates with people and that people might buy, then I'll go ahead and, you know, I'll make maybe 10 or 15 of that card um, and see if it sells. Okay. Now, how did you learn how to create your own stationery and, and um, artwork using a letterpress? Um, so I don't have any sort of formal art training. Um, and actually before I, um, was letter pressing the cards, I was making them all entirely by hand. Um, so (laughs) I know, (laughs) (laughs) um, so I was block printing the characters. So, um, you know, if you go on my Etsy, you'll see that most of my card designs have these little characters on them and you can sort of pick and choose skin tone and um, gender. Um, And those little characters, I um, initially, I carved them out of linoleum, um, which is something that I learned how to do in middle school art class. (laughs) Um, And I watched a couple YouTube videos and I, I carved them out of linoleum and then I was um, uh, using like little rubber stamps to stamp every single letter on the cards. And, um, and then that became a little bit unsustainable. Yeah. And I, I learned about letterpress, which was this, like, I think like really beautiful in between mm-hmm. of it still being like handmade, but just a little bit more automated. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, took a class, like I took a weekend class, um, at a studio and, um, and then I just started renting time and um, and I was living in Boston at the time, and the people who owned the studio, who are now really close friends of mine, were just like really wonderful and helped me troubleshoot. And I asked them so many questions, and I just kind of learned by by doing, and yeah. I, I kind of just fell in love with the process. Wow, amazing! So you started selling on Etsy in 2011, and it was and. For anyone listening, if you want to hop over and check out Janine's Etsy shop right now, again, it's quotations. It's spelled K-W-O-H-T-A-T-I-O-N-S. And it's a play on Janine's last name, which is Quo, K-W-O-H. That's an easy way to remember it. I liked the branding you did there, too, by the way. Oh, (laughs) thanks. Yeah, I couldn't resist the pun. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So... Initially, quotations was a hobby, and then it graduated to a side hustle, which I assume is when you first started making some money. And then recently, it's become your full-time business. Can you talk about the the evolution and the different transitions that you went through to get to where you are today? Sure. Yeah, it's evolved a lot over the years. So as you said, I, I um, opened my Etsy shop in 2011, and at that time, I wasn't even really thinking of it as a business. Mm. Um, I just I wanted to see what people's reactions were, um, like people who didn't know me personally, and Etsy seemed like um, a really easy way to do that. So I put a couple listings up, um, and I did that for... Um, a while, I would say a couple years. So I had my Etsy shop open, but it was more passive. Uh, um, you know, I'd fill orders when they came, but I didn't, um, I wasn't really thinking about it strategically, mm-hmm. I would say. Um, and then maybe 2013, 2014, um, I started doing craft shows. Um, and then I got into my first store and that really got me thinking, oh, you know, like maybe I do want to invest more of this, uh, more into this Mm -hmm. and think about it more as a business. Um, so I would say that's sort of the second phase, um, where I was doing Etsy. Um, you know, I was more actively managing my shop. I was doing craft shows. I was trying to get into retail shops. Um, and I did that really up until this year on the side and this whole time I had a full-time job. So this was, you know, always my, 
my side hustle. Yeah. Um, and then in June this year, I left my job. So for the past five months, um, I've been working on my business full time. Um, so it's funny, it feels like I've been at this for a really long time. Um, but it kind of feels like the business is both eight years old and kind of only five months old at the same time. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I get that feeling because it feels like once once it's taking up, it started to take up 100% of your time. I'm sure it took on a very different feel, a very different, you, your attitude towards it must have changed in some way um, in that this is now your everything. Right, definitely. Yeah. So um, how did you know it was time or how did you decide it was time to go full time? And 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 um, what was the thing that made you realize this is viable? If I just dedicate the time to this, I can make this my full time living. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and I feel like some of that is is still to be seen. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that the decision to go full-time happened both very slowly and very quickly. Mm-hmm. So slowly in that I thought about it a lot over the years, um, but not actually very seriously. More like, you know, if I were to set aside... Um, you know, all the realistic considerations and responsibilities, like, wouldn't it be great if I could make art full time? I don't think I actually, I wasn't really planning on doing it. Um, And then at the end of last year, I decided to make the leap um, without, to be honest, much of a plan. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, I think it's because as I've gotten older and more things have happened in my life, both good and bad, um, I kind of figure, you know, most things have a way of working out and very few things are irreversible. And it's not like if you get off a path, you can't get on it or get on another path. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think the thought of taking the risk just didn't scare me as much as it used to. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and then and then when things don't work out, I I think there's and in most cases, there's not much you could have done to prevent it anyways. Um, and you know, with our finite amount of time and energy, I figure, you know, I might as well spend it, you know, doing things and spending time with people that make me happy. Yeah. I like that. You kind of answered in a way, the, the a question that I, I was going to ask you, which was, um, now that you've taken that leap, if you have any fears or reservations, but I like that you said, most things are not irreversible. And um, I know a lot of us sometimes think if we make a decision, even if it's shaping up to not be the best decision, we need to stick with it. And and to some extent, in some situations, that that does make sense. There are some times where we need to persevere because things will change. But then on the other hand, there are some times where you can see that something isn't going to change but you have the option to change what you're doing if the situation won't change i hope i didn't just twist what you said in the wrong no (laughs) no that makes a lot of sense no i completely agree and you know to your point about when did i know that business would be viable Mm -hmm. i would say that i still uh, to be honest like i still don't um you know the business is profitable yeah. Um, but it's not enough for me to, to live on. So I'm also using my savings. Yeah. And I think for when I made that decision to go full time, something I wanted to be really clear about with myself was I didn't want it to go full time. If I felt at the end of the year or two years, I would only be happy if, if, you know, quotations was like, you know, huge and successful. Like mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure that even if it wasn't viable as a full-time job, I would have been happy that I made that decision because yeah. I took the time to figure out whether it was or it wasn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that was also something I had to get comfortable with. Okay, good. Now, Janine, success looks different to each of us. So to one person, finding success might mean 
hitting a certain annual income or monthly income. And to someone else, it might mean, um, it might, it might be a different number, but it might also mean having flexibility to do other things. So for you and for quotations, have you yet defined what success looks like for you so that when you hit it, you know, you're there, even though it might, it might not be a, a certain, uh, dollar figure or or what have you it might be a certain lifestyle that you're aiming towards does that make sense yeah it does um that's a tough question oh, okay. <laughs> um I you know I don't and I think that's part of what I wanted to take this time to figure out mm. um I have a couple scenarios in my head yeah. um you know one being you know quotations is, is everything that I do and, and that works out or quotations is, you know, a significant part of my income and, you know, through freelance work or something else that also gives me a flexible lifestyle, I can cobble that together and yeah. I can see myself being really happy doing that, yes. um, as well. So I think it's kind of, I'm doing this, um, I don't know, it's kind of like a journey of finding out like what are the different options that are feasible and also that I would be um, content with. Yes. I like that because I think sometimes we look at one definition of what success is. And and most often we look at it as I have to be making X number of dollars. And, And that number is not a number that we come up with. It's a number that is defined by us maybe looking at somebody else's business plan or what somebody else is doing and it's not necessarily practical for everyone and I know I've found over the years that um, what somebody else defines as their success is hardly ever similar to what I feel is me reaching a level of success that I'm I'm comfortable with and so um, I, I hope that others who who are um growing their Etsy shop and and have plans for it will realize they have the freedom to determine what success for them is because it's not the same across the board. Yeah, I think that's such a good point and it can be really tough. Like I'm I'm not saying that I don't go on Instagram and oh, yeah. you know <laughs> look at people's shops and um you know like w- wonder what I'm doing with my life. Yeah. Um <laughs> <laughs> but I do think it's like such a good thing to keep reminding yourself and trying to stay grounded in what it is that you want, um, yeah. separate from what you're being bombarded with. Yeah. Now, back in the early days of, of Etsy, do you remember how long it took for for your your shop to start gaining traction? Um, I know you said initially you weren't you were, it was more passive, but when you started to pay a little bit more attention to it, about how long do you think it took before your sales became consistent? Um, I don't, I, I haven't looked at the numbers, but I would guess probably a maybe like six months to a year. And I think that's a combination of things. So one, um, I did start to more actively manage my shop and, you know, use a lot of the features that are there, like the tags um, and the descriptions. Um, And and I started to put more things up in the shop. And at the same time, as I mentioned, I started doing um, craft shows and having my um, cards in stores Mm -hmm. and, it took a while, but then I, I think I started to see this cross pollination, Mm -hmm. um, you know, where people would, you know, take my card at a show and then go to Etsy, um, um, or vice versa. So I think that also helped like being on sort of being out in the world in multiple ways. Yeah. So at the craft shows you, you do or did, would you, and do, or do you promote your Etsy shop while you know in person so you have cards so that people can actually go on etsy and find you there yeah so i I still do um craft shows i don't do as many as i used to um 
I'm doing a bunch for the holidays, but I, I, I used to do them, you know, like every weekend or so. Wow. Um, but they're, um, they're quite, they're quite tiring. Um, so I've, I've tried to cut it back on the number. Um, but I do, I, um, I have business cards at the craft show. And then I also mentioned that I am online. Um, and one recent change is, so I was, Etsy was my only online platform up until a couple months ago. Um, I had a separate website just so I could put, you know, like my blog and about me on there, but it would redirect to my Etsy, Mm -hmm. um, if someone wanted to buy something. Um, I recently set up just a separate website on Shopify. Um, so I have been directing people online, but instead of directing to my Etsy shop, it directs to my, to my main site. Okay. Now. And that's quotations.com. Yes. Okay. I will link to not just Janine's Etsy shop, but also to her website, um, quotations.com. It's spelled the same way. Again, it's K-W-O-H-T-A-T-I-O-N-S.com. And the quotations.com site is that's hosted. Well, I shouldn't say hosted, um, but that's um, based on Shopify. Yes. Okay. So um, now that's where you, you send people to because that's yours, yours, and not, mm-hmm. not the Etsy platform. Have you found that um, it's easier to sell through your own platform or are you still figuring out how to make that your primary um, sales venue online? Um, I am still figuring out how to drive traffic to it. I Mm -hmm. think that my plan, my plan is to keep both because I think that they're very different. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think some of your other um, people who've been on your podcast have made this point also that, you know, Etsy is, um, you know, it's not just like an, an, an online hosting site. It's a marketplace. So people go on Etsy. It's really well known. And even if they have no idea who you are, just by searching, they can find your shop. Yeah. Whereas, you know, for someone to go to quotations.com, um, a lot of that is more directed traffic from my Instagram, um, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I think that they, there's different customers that go to each one. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, can we talk about what the inspiration behind the products you sell are. So initially it was um, just greeting cards, but you've branched out into artwork, but, but there's a theme to the, the cards and the art prints that you offer. Yeah. So I would say um, in terms of themes, like I think a big one for me is representation. Yeah. Um, I think representation, so seeing people who look like you, who act or think like you, is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think there's a lot of conversations around this now as it relates to, like, movies and TV shows um, and how they, you know, shape our identities and interactions. And some voices and stories are really well represented in these multifaceted ways and um, other people's stories are not. Mm and I think the same thing holds true for greeting cards. I, um, you know, if you think about it, we, we give cards when something is, you know, special, um, something that we want to acknowledge. And um, a lot of the greeting cards are centered sort of around the same occasions, like weddings, birthdays, Mother's Day, et cetera. Yeah. And they assume that our cards, uh, that our lives are constructed in a certain way, where, whereas like there are all these different things that happen in our lives and we celebrate in different ways. That's you don't really necessarily see in the card aisle. Mm-hmm. Um, so for example, like I have wedding cards for interracial couples or gay and lesbian couples, um, you know, like birthday cards for little brown boys and girls yeah, yeah. and, you know, like cards of celebration for your friends or family who are trans, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I just think like that's what our lives actually look like. And um, there should be cards that help facilitate the celebration of that. Um, I like that because um, I was I was looking through your cards. I was like, 
it's so true. Um, you have one that says, let's celebrate all the things. And there's a menorah and there's a Christmas tree. And it's like, yeah, it's true. Nowadays, um, you see more, what's more the norm are less um, easily defined by what you would see like in, you know, in the the card aisle at the grocery store wherever you buy you buy your Mm -hmm. cards um but especially i like your life experiences cards because you never find a card that um not not commercially anyway that that meets someone where they are one i particularly liked was your am i grieving correctly flow chart and um i liked that because a friend of mine lost her mom and in uh, sometimes i shouldn't say all the time but sometimes you know I, i'm i'm nigerian and sometimes you know people <laughs> you get to extremes when it comes to grieving right you know highly dramatic and you know everybody's crying and falling all over the place and all whatnot and quite frankly i i'm closer to that end of the spectrum <laughs> Mm-hmm. But then there's the other end that, you know, sometimes people will say, you know, control yourself, compose yourself. You know, it's life. It happens. Just move forward. And I'm so not that not that person. And this friend of mine, um, there were family members that were saying, you know, you know, pull yourself together. You need to we need to bury your, your mother and move ahead. And I was so upset because she needed to cry and she needed to experience the grief and she needed to just deal with it the way she was naturally. And it wasn't helping that she wasn't getting that from, you know, um, people in, in the family circle. And when I saw that card, I thought, man, I wish I had seen this a year ago because I would have bought five for different people who needed to know it's okay to grieve the way you're grieving. So I like that you you tap into life situations that um, Hallmark and Carlton Cards and whoever just are too um, maybe afraid to to tap into, or maybe they just don't feel like it's you know it's worth going that deeply into people's lives and emotions and what's really going on. Yeah, yeah, I um, you're right that a lot of it, um, the cards sort of come from lived experiences, and a lot of them are are my own. Um, you know, I kind of say like quotations is my life in cards, mm. and I made that card and and some other sympathy cards because I lost someone that I loved a, a few years ago, mm. and I had the same um, experience. Um, you know, like I have a really wonderful support network, but I think grief is inherently a very isolating yes. process, yeah. experience. Um, and one, I, I received a lot of um, sympathy cards and they were so important to me to read at that time. Mm-hmm. Like they were really a lifeline for me. Yeah. And also I realized how many terrible sympathy cards there are out there. <laughs> <laughs> or so I thought, and I wanted to make these cards that were very honest that were, you know, the words that I wanted to hear because I was, you know, confused and still working through, like if I'm, you know, one week out or six months out or five years out, is it okay for me to be feeling, you know, however I'm feeling, whether that's still, you know, devastated or happy or both at the same time. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think there are these, there's this common narrative about grief and the process and how long it takes. And, and at least in my experience, that's not true. And I just wanted to put something out there saying like, this is, you know, like, this is how I am. And if, if this is how you are also, like, you're not, you're not alone. Yeah. Yep. I like that. So good for you. I wish my only regret is that (laughs) I don't come up with these ideas but when I see somebody else who comes up with it, I'm like, ah, oh, that's such a good idea. Why didn't I do that? <laughs> I feel that way all the time. <laughs> it's like, yes, I needed that card. Why didn't I think of making it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But then you also have some humorous ones too, 
which I like um, as well. And again, they're just things that, you know, you see and you're like, oh, I, you know, I, somebody comes right to, to mind who I would want to send that to. But again, I wouldn't see that if I was out at a regular retail store looking looking for shops now I mean looking for cards is it your goal I I want to ask to one day have your your cards and and your art prints in general in in a retail space I know you mentioned that you did at some point I don't know if you still do yeah I do so I um I don't know exact number I'm probably in maybe 20 or or 30 stores um none in new york which is where i'm based but um, a lot in boston which is where i was um, in that surrounding area and then independent gift shops sort of around the country um so that's definitely another sort of channel Mm -hmm. that i'm working on and i would love for the cards to be in um, more stores okay did you did you get those placements through wholesale channels or were you pounding the pavement or the, you know, the online pavement, if you will, to get <laughs> those placements? Um, yeah, it's been a mix. So um, at first I kind of just walked into stores <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and like dropped off some samples mm. um, and that, actually worked although now that I've been reading more about how to get into wholesale stores everyone says not to do that um yeah because I think it it interrupts like the the general flow of retail so like people Mm. are trying to buy things they don't necessarily want you up at their counter um you know pitching to them oh Um, okay yeah I think it's a little disruptive okay um but I, I didn't know that so that's what I did (laughs) um uh to to some success and so it's a combination of that. Um, some people have found me through Instagram um, and some other online platforms. And then I've also, you know, reached out via email okay. um, to stores. Yeah. Okay. What have you found has been the most effective of the different methods you've, you've tried? Um. I think just meeting people, I think, um, is the most effective and it's kind of happened in some roundabout ways, but I think there's something about seeing the cards in person versus, you know, receiving an email with some images, um, that's really helpful for people to actually, you know, see and touch it. And Mm so, you know, just, I've met people at, craft markets um who've then recommended me to stores sort of having I think having that in-person touch point is actually really helpful even if you're not necessarily just like walking into the store yeah um to pitch them okay now a couple of times I, I know you've mentioned Instagram can we talk about in general what your social media strategy if if you would call it having one is um what do you do? What do you primarily spend your time doing when it comes to social media and which platforms do you devote the most time to? Um, sure. So I primarily use Instagram. Um, I think just because it's such a visual platform, it makes sense for what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also on Facebook, um, and Twitter and Pinterest, but, um, primarily I use Instagram. Um, and, you know, initially I joined, um, I created a business account for quotations just cause I, I felt like I should, mm-hmm. um, but it's actually been really wonderful. Like not just in terms of, you know, putting products out there, but also creating a community. I really didn't expect to have that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've managed to connect with a lot of mm-hmm. makers and a lot of my customers and sort of have more, um, of an interaction that way. That's not just a sort of a transaction. Yeah. Um, so I use it, I would say a lot for that, for engaging, um, with people who are, you know, interested in what I'm making. Um, so for say Instagram, um, do you try to post a new product every day or, or, um, 
when you come up with the new product line, that's when you you'll do a post. And do you keep it strictly to just your products or do you try and mix in some about me type posts? Yeah, so I um I generally post about once a day. Mm-hmm. Um I know there's <laughs> there's so much out there about how mm-hmm. and when to post. But yes. <laughs> Um, I try not to get too precious about it. I just kind of, you know, try to post regularly. Um, and I post a mix. So I post, um, product photos, um, you know, sometimes highlights of stores that I'm in or events that I'm at. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I do mix in some of the personal, um, I think people also fall on either side of that. I think for me, because my cards are so personal, um, they're just kind of inherently tied to who I am and my experiences. I think that makes sense. Um, So I do tend to get maybe more personal than some on my Instagram. Um, And then in terms of posting new products, um, like I said, like I will post like work in progress photos as I'm working on them. Um, in terms of the final like product launch, Mm -hmm. um, that has also changed. I used to, um, you know, kind of make things as I, as they came to me and I would post them one at a time. And one of the changes that I've been trying to make as I'm full time now and have more time is to try to be more intentional about sitting down and designing and making new products and having sort of Mm -hmm. a couple products to release at a time. Yeah. Um, I don't always cause I get excited and I'll just post whatever I have first, <laughs> but that is something that people say you should do. And I, and I have been trying to, you know, have more of a collection maybe yeah. of, of products to, to launch at once. Um, in addition to social media, do you market your Etsy shop any other way, specifically like using Etsy's promoted listings or, the Google, uh, what what do they call now? Google ad, not Google ads, but um, I forgot yeah. what the Google one is called now. Um, I don't remember the name, but I you know what you're talking about. Yes, There's, I feel like it's always changing. I know. Um, <laughs> I I don't regularly. I think I've probably tried them so. Uh, not the Google one, but the Etsy promoted listings and and then also Facebook um, oh. and Instagram now have ads. Yeah. So I have done, you know, like a small campaign here or there, yeah. but it's not something that I use regularly. Mm-hmm. I hear that it's effective, but I personally haven't seen. Um, I di- it didn't really translate into sales for me, okay. but um I, that's also not an area that I've, I've invested a lot of time or money. And is that just with promoted listings or, or the same thing with Facebook ha- ads and Pinterest ads, if you tried those too? Yeah, same with those. Um, yeah. It's on it's on my list to explore further. <laughs> yes, I know. And those take so much every time. And I, I've tried with the Facebook ads, but there is... It's so intricate. It's not just when you go on Facebook to set up an ad, it makes it seem straightforward enough. I've tried them before. I've done them before. They're easy enough to set up. But then when you start reading what, you know, um, people who found success with these paid ads say they did, I realize there's so much more to it than, you know, just the basics that you can do to set one up and like I also have not found a lot of success with paid ads um I haven't tried Pinterest ads I've only tried um promoted listings on Etsy and Facebook ads and even though they were easy enough for me to set up I think I was missing a lot of the intricacies that the people who have really studied how these things work understand and um so like you it's on the to-do list but honestly I think I'm crossing them off my to-do list because it just keeps <laughs> there's so much going on and it's it's hard to keep up and 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 learn all the things 
Yeah, I, I feel the same way. And I think, I think you're right. I think, um, they're easy enough to set up, but I'm sure there's something in the timing or like how you're defining who you're targeting yeah. that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yes. So, um, what does a typical day look like for you now? Um, and how do you manage your time when it comes to taking care of everything that goes into running your business full time? Yeah. So definitely still figuring that one out. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would say every day is a little bit different, which is a really nice change of pace actually to have that flexibility. Um, I think in general, I try to split up my day so that I'm not working on one thing for the full day if I don't have to. Mm. Um, So I kind of think of the business in like three blocks of activities. So the first one is related to building up the business and keeping it running. So answering emails, you know, bookkeeping, Mm. that kind of more administrative Mm -hmm. stuff like on the computer. And then the second is, you know, time actually making the cards and filling orders. So going to the studio, you know, painting the cards, etc. Um, but these are so like making cards that I have already designed. Okay. Um, and then the last bucket is kind of more open, like thinking of new designs or free writing, just giving myself some time to be creative and see where that leads. Yes. Um, so those are kind of the three buckets. I try to have a balance every day. Um, I don't always achieve that. <laughs> I also watch a lot of TV, <laughs> but that's what I, that's what I aim for. And I, and I feel like when I do do that, it helps because I am kind of exercising my brain in these different ways. Um, in terms of how I manage my time, um, something that I found really helpful that I do is I think it's called time blocking. Yeah. Um, so instead of just writing a to-do list for the day, I actually open up my calendar. I use Google calendar and I block out each hour of each day. Hmm. So, you know, I'll say nine to 10, I'll write emails, you know, 11 to 1230, I'll pack orders, 1230 to 130, I have lunch. Um, and I do that for the whole day. And what that does, it, it helps me actually visually see, like, am I, is my plan feasible? Mm-hmm. And also I think where I often get stuck is, you know, in the whole universe of things that I feel like I should be doing, which is really overwhelming. Mm-hmm. What should I be doing right now? Yeah. And I find that making that decision the night before or in the morning of is easier for me than making that decision like hour by hour. Yes. So that's actually been super helpful for me. So do you plan out the next day, the day before, like you, you time block, you time block your day, the, the day before? Um, it's a mix. So mm-hmm. I will throw blocks of time on a day that I know I should be doing something. So yeah. for example, if I, um, have a bunch of orders and it's Monday mm-hmm. and I know that I, you know, want to wait till the end of the week to fill all of them, I'll just like throw a block of time on Thursday. So I'll just like generally put things on days as I think of them. And then the night before or the morning of, I'll go through and like more, um, in more detail, sort of flesh out what the day looks like. Okay. And are you pretty, um, um, what's the word? Not flexible, but lenient with yourself. So if you get to a certain time block where you're supposed to be doing one thing and you just don't feel like doing it, do you allow yourself to deviate from, from the schedule or are you more, more um, disciplined and whether or not you feel like doing it, you just do it? Um, Yeah, I think it depends on what it is. I think there are some things that I'm like this, this has to get done today. It's either something that actually has a deadline or it's something that I've already been putting off and I know I need to do. And so in my head, I'll say, you know, if I don't do anything else on my calendar today, like this is the thing I'm going to do. Yes. And then everything else, um, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll move it. Um, if I feel like I don't actually have to do it that day. Okay. I like that. 
Um, I think sometimes I'm too easy on myself. And um, if I don't feel like doing something, I like I would I, I will allow myself not to. And sometimes it's just ridiculous because then the whole day <laughs> goes by and it's like you allowed yourself not to do anything constructive. This is. Wasteful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do that too. And I would say two things. Like one, what I also do is I block in not just work time, but free time for myself too. And mm-hmm. somehow I feel like if it's in my calendar, it feels more Official. like it feels more okay to do because yeah. <laughs> it's in my calendar is what yes. I should be doing. Even if it's like take a break um, for two hours. Yeah. Um, so I, I also try to block out time for myself. Um mm-hmm. And the other thing is, yeah, it's it's a balance, and and I I feel like I I'm pretty good, but I also swing to the extremes too. You know, some days I'm like you, and I'm, you know, I get sucked into watching TV, and I, I don't do anything. And then other days I sit down and I I realize like I haven't left the apartment in you know like ten hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think that's yeah, I think that's one of the harder things of, of working for yourself. There's no, no one really around to hold you accountable either right. way. Yes. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned blocking time for yourself because I just realized that's something I don't do. Like I'll make a list and I, I, I haven't tried this time blocking strategy, but I like the idea of it um, because it, 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 if I see something tangible, I'm, I'm more likely to follow it. That's why I do. I make to-do lists all the time. Um, And they work for like physical handwritten lists work Mm -hmm. for me better than keeping track on, on my phone because I just won't pick up the phone and look at it, (laughs) but I will look at a physical piece of paper and cross things off. And, you know, I get my satisfaction from being able to cross things off and know that they're done. Um, But I don't, put in times for me like I won't schedule in time for lunch I won't schedule Uh. in time you know downtime for just okay you know do whatever you want to do I'll I'll work myself till I have to but I think your strategy of actually building that in will be more effective yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's also something I, I'm trying to be better about because I I do think when you're working for yourself and also when it's something that you enjoy doing, sometimes like you have to, you have to make yourself stop doing it and take a break because yeah. you probably need it even if you're not realizing that you, yes. that you do. Yep. So true. So Janine, all right. So Etsy has changed tremendously. Um, especially over the last couple of years, um, they've gone through some ups and downs and what have you, but we're not going to talk about that. I want to talk about the features that Etsy has implemented. Um, and I don't know how much attention you pay to, well, you must, because this is what you're doing full time now. But in the, in the shop manager, um, Etsy has integrated a lot of new features in there. Some come in for like a day or two and then they disappear. And then some are, are around to stay. Are there any of the newer features that you've been able to play around with that you particularly like and have found helpful? Hmm. Can you, sorry. yeah, okay, I, sh- so I I'll should be, know this, but can you give no, me no, no, some yeah, examples? I'll be, I'll be more specific. Okay. So I'm going to go to my shop manager really quickly. Um, like now you can do, Etsy has this new feature where it tells you that some people have your products in their shopping carts. So Essentially, they're saying, hey, somebody's getting ready to buy your to to buy your product, but they're just not following through. Have you have you used that feature? Are you from are you aware of that feature where you can send like an abandoned checkout yeah. email to that person? Yeah. yeah. So I, I was just looking at that. Um, I I haven't, but it's 
again, it's on my list. Yeah. Um, and I, I just put it on my other shop. So on my standalone shop, I just did that and I will do it for my Etsy shop. Um, I actually think that's really helpful. Um, I have been going to some like marketing, um, workshops and Mm -hmm. a lot of people, it seems like having that pop up that's, um, it's either a pop-up on your shop or an email that they get afterwards seems to be um, really effective. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a good feature that I'll, I'll be taking advantage of. Yes. And um, did you, um, did you um, switch to any of the paid plans on Etsy or you stayed with the regular basic Etsy account? I stayed with the basic Okay. Um, yeah, I say with the basic one. Okay. Is there a particular reason or is it primarily just because like for me, it was because the features that they offered, um, I didn't feel would make a difference, would make that big of a difference for my Etsy shop. I wasn't revolting against having to pay, but what, what went into your decision to keep just a basic Etsy shop? Yeah, I felt like be- that and also the fact that I had another standalone shop. Oh yes. Um, I think between the the two, it felt like maybe a, a little bit more redundant. Versus if Etsy was my only online platform, mm-hmm. then I think I would probably consider it. Okay. What would you say is a lesson about selling on Etsy that you've learned? Um, Usually I, I, I say that you've learned the hard way, but it doesn't have to be the hard way, but something, a really valuable lesson that you've learned in your time selling on Etsy that you can share with someone else who's listening and uh, perhaps from your experience, they can um, avoid learning that lesson and just know it up front. Oof. I don't know if I've had any hard lessons, okay. knock on wood, but... um. <laughs> I don't know. I guess, I mean, if for someone who's not an Etsy seller yet and is thinking about it, mm-hmm. um, I would say just do it. Like, don't wait until you have the perfect product or perfect product photo and you know exactly how all the analytics works. Like, just <laughs> open up a shop, put up what you have, and just, like, put your work out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for me that that's something that I really... I still appreciate about Etsy and it was it they and when I was just starting out you know I think I might not have started at all if Etsy wasn't around because you know if I had to make my own website and learn e-commerce I probably wouldn't have done it um yeah but Etsy makes it so easy to take that first step I think I would just encourage people to do it even if they feel like they may not be ready yes um the other one, I mean, people probably already know this, but Etsy shipping, I know that's pretty basic, but for a long time, I was writing my own shipping labels <laughs> and like going yes. to the post office and standing in line um, for way longer than I should have. Yeah. Um, so I would say Etsy shipping, get yourself a label maker and it's yes. like life changing. <laughs> oh, Yes. <laughs> I, I so agree with you. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I, I never hand wrote my labels, but I would print them out on eight and a half by 11s and cut them and then tape them down, <laughs> yeah. which seems very archaic now, but the label printer, and I, I feel like I sound like a broken record, but I, I completely agree with you. The label printer is life changing. It's worth every penny. And from what I've seen on Amazon, which is where I bought mine, the price has gone up a little bit. So if you haven't bought yours yet, buy it now. I'll put a link to it's a it's a Dymo. I have a Dymo. What what brand do you use? That's what I have. I have a Dymo. I think it's a 4XL. Um, it's great. I think yeah. people also use zebras. Yes, um, zebra is the other one. Yeah, but I, I have a Dymo one and um, I love it. Yep. There might also be holiday sales. I don't know, but maybe if people oh, want to yeah. wait for that. Yes, yes, there might be. Maybe they'll have another Prime Day or something. Yeah. Yeah. 
but definitely worth it and stock up on your labels too from there. Even if it feels like, I think they sell the labels in rolls of, well, they have different sizes. And I remember when I was buying my first roll and I was like, should I buy the 200 label roll or the, it was like maybe 600 labels. And I was like, will I ever have 600 sales? But then, you know, I I just thought, yes, I plan to have 600 sales. I'm going to buy the big old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's funny. I was just thinking, I've been thinking about that a lot because having to sort of estimate materials or like stocking up an inventory like we were talking about Mm -hmm. it's I was like it's such an exercise in optimism because (laughs) you're like I'm going to buy 2,000 envelopes I'm going because and also as you're trying to like cut your cost the you you know before I was buying them like a little box at a time and now I'm buying like these huge sheets of paper and (laughs) it's a little daunting but it is like you just have to believe (laughs) Yes. <laughs> that you're going to need them. <laughs> yes, it's so true. I li- I like that phrase. It's an exercise in optimism. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Now, are there any features that currently don't yet exist on the Etsy platform that you would like to see implemented? Hmm. I don't. And if not, that's okay. Because they are rolling out a lot of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think for the for the basic, I mean, it would be nice to be able to customize how the shop looks um, a bit more, even on the basic ones. Yeah, I think Um, so. I feel like that is maybe the main thing, just to be able to um, have maybe like a couple more pages um, that you can sort of that's not just your your prime product page to sort of round out your store yeah okay good one um i do like that they seem to be coming out with so many new features like you know all, i mean they don't all last and I, I know i've said that twice so i'm just going to come right out and say which one i'm specifically referring <laughs> to so for like two days over the summer they rolled out an analytics feature, which it was like, if you blinked, you would have missed it. But I don't think I saw that. Yeah, yeah, I don't think many people did. And I think my timing was just perfect because I logged in one day, I was creating listings and I saw the orange button. There was some orange flag to say there was a new feature. So I, I went into it And it was like, have you ever looked at um, Google Analytics? Um, I, (laughs) I have it. Um, But and and once in a while, I'll go in and and look at it. But I find it very overwhelming. Yeah. Okay. good. I'm glad you said that because it was like Google Analytics, but stripped down to just what is understandable and relevant. So it was a step up from the basic stats that you have in 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 the shop manager mm-hmm. and and it, it just had more information but not overwhelming and more like it had the keywords that people came to your store from and from where and I can't remember what it was it had these graphs in it and it was just different and it was, I was like, I was so excited about it. And I was like, oh, and I remember I saw it late at night. So I was like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to come in here. I'm going to dig in. I'm going to change my tags because this is what people are find, are, are looking for. And this is what I have. And there was so much good stuff in there. And I looked the next day and I was like, okay, I had to go and run some errands. And I came back and I sat down I got ready to do it. And it was gone. Oh like, no! What? And then, <laughs> then they put an announcement, which wasn't even. It wasn't in the weekly newsletters. It was just I just happened to randomly see it on the site where they said they had turned off that feature so they could, um, so they could um, uh, fix not fix it, but you know, do some more work on it. And I was like, it yeah. was great. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't need to turn it off. <laughs> So anyway, I'm I'm waiting for them to turn that one back on. 
Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah. I hope that they do. Um, yeah, I will say that there's not a specific feature, but I think I get turning on features and letting people play around with it and then turning them off to fix them or if they're not popular yeah. is a helpful way to get feedback. But it makes me a little bit wary of any new feature and how much time I should invest in learning it yeah. and you know putting it in my shop. So I feel like I'm a little, it makes me, yeah, a little bit, I'm less likely to use it, I think, yeah, um, up front because I want to see if it lasts. <laughs> yes, and you know, I wasn't familiar with the whole concept, I mean, the whole idea of them turning things on and off. I just thought if it's there, it's there. This is the first time that I was, that I knew that they could turn things off. And um, now I know, so like you, I, you know, I'll wait. Um, and I don't know, which ones they which ones they um turn on that they decide are there to stay you know i guess if they officially make an announcement and email everyone then that's a good sign that it's there to stay because for this one there was no announcement or anything it was just it just popped up in my in my shop manager and as quickly as it popped up it was gone so I think that will be my cue now is if there was no official announcement and it just showed up, don't fall in love with it too quickly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, and this is a less of the feature, but um, the Etsy wholesale platform also. Yeah. Um, I was hoping that that would um, take off. And and I did get um, a few stores through that, but, I, but I'm guessing you know since they they closed that down that it, yeah. it wasn't working the way that they had hoped no yes and, and I know um that that also caused some angst because I know quite a, a number of sellers were able to connect with with retailers through that platform um but a while ago I talked with oh man can't remember her name but wholesale in a box I'll link to that and um th- that's all they do is help small small businesses um connect with retail stores to sell on on wholesale to them oh I feel so bad I've, Emily Emily yes <laughs> um of wholesale in a box and so um I know some sellers have used their service and and actually found it a lot more user friendly and and helpful to them than um what they were getting through Etsy wholesale and 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 that's because I think they do they set up their platform differently so when you're ready that might be an option you can look into and see if um, it if it works for you yeah that's great i'll definitely check that out What's something you're doing now that you would say is working really well for you or you're just happy about? Um, I think one thing I've done that I started last year is just to give myself permission to make things that are different. Mm. Um, So... Initially, I was only making greedy card, greeting cards and, you know, sort of all in the same style with the same sort of characters on, on the cards. Yeah. And and I, I love that. And I think that will always kind of be the cornerstone of my brand. But I also, you know, felt like I wanted to, um, you know, write and draw other things and then you know, maybe make things that weren't greeting cards and see what that would let me do. Um, And I was a little bit worried at first of, you know, like maybe it's not on brand. um, Maybe it's not any good. um, But I think just giving myself the freedom to, you know, like make whatever I'm moved to make Mm -hmm. um, has been really freeing and the reaction has been um, really great. You know, like those sympathy cards, if you take a look like they're you know they kind of have a different look and tone um to some of the other cards I've made in the past but I'm you know I'm glad that they um that that I decided to make them yes I like that because I think sometimes we do get we creative people put ourselves in boxes 
as as odd as that sounds, um, that we box ourselves up, even though we are creative, because we feel like, well, this is what I do. So it's what I'm going to do. Right. And um, sometimes don't give ourselves permission to actually, you know, explore different creative um, options for ourselves. So thank you for sharing that. Are there any tools or resources for selling on Etsy or in general for running your business that you're using now and you find particularly helpful and that you don't mind sharing with us? Sure. Um, so I listen to a lot of podcasts, obviously, including yours you. um, on Etsy and then sort of um, in general about being a creative entrepreneur Um I I watch a lot of Skillshare and Creative Live videos. Yeah. Um, so they have like really great online classes on just about anything from like branding to, you know, how to make your logo, um, you know, to actually like calligraphy, like anything that you <laughs> want to learn, someone is, is probably teaching it somewhere yeah. on there or just like YouTube videos. So I learn a lot. Um just by watching online videos or taking online classes. Um, And then I think um, just having a community of makers has been like both just such a joy and also so helpful for me. Mm. You know, I think there are so many resources online. It's really hard, I find, to parse through all of them. Mm -hmm. Um, But I've been lucky and managed to, you know, make friends um, with other makers and artists and, um, uh, that has just been so helpful, um, in terms of, you know, pointing to resources or just yeah. like understanding their process. Um, I think just like, yeah, I think the, that in-person connection is, um, invaluable. Yes. So, um, do you attend meetups or just um, general networking events with other other makers? Um, I do. So um, I was part of an Etsy meetup um, when I was living in Boston. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping to join the one in New York, but I keep missing um, like the, the dates. Um, <laughs> and then I'm also part of another maker group called Handmade in Brooklyn. So nice. it's a group of local makers. And then... Um, I don't know if you know Rising Tide Society. Yes, I just learned about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're really great and they have a lot of resources. Um, uh, like their tips and, and stuff are really good. And then they have, um, it's a national organization. They have local branches yeah. that meet up once in a while. So um, I have also go to those. I find it's really helpful, again, like for resources and tips, but also um, I spend a lot of time by myself mm-hmm. and it's nice to just go out and be among people who are making something else Um, (laughs) and, um, you know, hear about what they're doing um, and also, you know, hear people talk about similar things that you're turning around in your own head. Yes. Yes. And, and just like you said, just being around other people. Yeah. When, (laughs) when you spend time alone working in your studio or, or home or wherever, um, it's so important to connect with people. Um, and even if you like, for me, I'm not, I, I know this sounds weird every time I say it, I'm not a huge talker, but just <laughs> being in the company of other living beings, it makes a difference. And um, I try to make sure I, 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 I do that as much as possible just um, because we need that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I will link to these resources that you've mentioned, um, Rising Tide Society, Handmade in Brooklyn, Creative Life, Skillshare, all, all of these I will link to in the notes for this episode. Great. And I, okay, I didn't ask you this beforehand. And if you don't have one, that's okay. But if you do, do you have an Etsy shop shout out? And this could be another seller who... Um, maybe you like their products or they've they've helped you along the way or um, you just want to give some, you know, good send, you know, send some good 
thoughts their way. Is there any other Etsy shop that you'd like to mention or seller? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I feel like there's so many and I'm coming up blank. blank. Don't worry. It happens all the but... time. And I keep forgetting <laughs> to ask people ahead of time so that, you know, or I have all these makers, but I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if they're on Etsy. Um, you can mention them I... anyway, if, if you know their, their brand names and I can look them up and okay. link to them. Yeah, sure. Um, so just enough nonsense um, is my friend Jen's um, shop. It's like her initials, J-E-N. Um, okay. And she uh, makes really beautiful letterpress stationery um, and totes. And she's one of the people who own the letterpress studio that I was talking about before in Boston. Oh, yeah. So she's like an amazing artist and also just has been like such a like a mentor to me. Um and we'll be doing some holiday markets together in Boston. So if you're, if anyone's in that area, they should come oh, nice. see us. Nice. Um, yeah. So I would say her. And then um, I will, I'll email you some names if that's okay. Yes. Well, that's I'll, fine. I'll do, I'll do a little <laughs> Etsy search myself. Okay. That's <laughs> fine. And maybe I should just make this the creative the the fellow creator shout out so that it doesn't have to be limited to Etsy Etsy sellers because if Jen isn't there I'm going to link to her website anyway so okay yes great so thank you now Janine what's the best way folks can connect with you if they want to get in touch um yeah they can send me um an email either through the site uh, through my website or it's just info at quotations.com. Okay. Um, and they can also send me a direct message on, on Instagram. I'm on there a lot. <laughs> okay. All right. I will have those in the notes for this episode, as well as links to Janine's Etsy shop and her website. Again, that's quotations. Etsy shop is quotations, K W O H. T-A-T-I-O-N-S and her website is the same quotations.com and I will link to those as well and the website and um, where you can find her on Instagram too. Is it at quotations? I'm just guessing. I haven't looked. It's at quotations. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> good job branding, Janine. Yeah. I'm lucky no one else has taken that name. So. Yeah. <laughs> Janine, thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you for spending this time talking with me about your business and what you're doing. Um, I'm, I'm excited for you that you're now doing this full time. And even though it's not been up, uh, up to a year that you're doing this full time, I feel like, you know, things are going to change and evolve for you. And can we talk again, maybe in, in, well, you pick how long, um, <laughs> when, 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 things have gotten to a point where you feel like oh okay this is now what I'm doing can we talk about that yeah definitely I would I would love that and and thank you again for having me on um it's been it's been so fun <laughs> <laughs> you are most welcome thank you for coming and I thank you for listening to the podcast this week and I will be back again thank you for listening you can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, and while you're there, please leave a review, too. Visit ConvoMe.com to leave a comment or feedback on this episode. <laughs>